of two of the most successful, two of the most expensive criminal defense attorneys in the country. Now, to the Justice Department, criminal defense lawyers like these two have become part of the crime problem themselves because they so often manage to get their clients off and because they are so often paid with money their clients have come by from drugs and racketeering. But the Justice Department now has a new weapon in the war on crime, a law that says that those fat lawyers' fees must be forfeited to the feds if the government can prove the money came from criminal activity. So, as we said when we first broadcast this piece last December, to the mercenary and the mouthpiece, the war on crime has turned into a war on criminal defense lawyers. This is the mercenary, Joel Hershorn of Miami. He is proud to call himself a hired gun. He has made millions resourcefully defending drug smugglers and drug dealers. Drug war? What is that? Drug war? I mean, I would like to know there's a war on muggers, so when I go to my car from this courthouse, I don't have to worry about someone mugging me. Diamond Joel, they call him, has earned a reputation for performing miracles in the courtroom. But he can be tough on his own clients there, too. Is it true that in the courtroom, you turned to your client and said, if you really want a good job of cross-examination, up the ante. That is a flat out lie. What did you say? What I told him was, if he wanted to have my enthusiasm, as well as my ability, which he already had, had he ought to pay the fee that he had promised me. In this and in other cases, because I am a mercenary, when a man makes a bargain with me on a fee, I expect to get paid. Just like when I was in the middle of a trial, a client bounced a check on me in another case. Now, here you are as a lawyer, fighting for a man's liberty, and he bounces a check. What would you do if your paycheck bounced? Do you think you'd finish this interview with enthusiasm? That guy who bounced the check, what happened to him? Well, he made the check good during trial over the luncheon recess. And the final analysis, did he win or lose? He lost, but not because of my cross-examination. But the check was good. Oh, yeah, it was very good, because he made it good with cash. With all of the money to be made on drugs, have you ever been tempted? Have you never been tempted to get in on a deal? Are you kidding me? No, I'm tempted. Never, never, never. I had a client once lay a million dollars in front of me, in cash. And if I wasn't tempted to take a case for a million dollars, you think I'd be tempted to get involved in a drug deal? Well, why did you turn down a million dollars? Well, because, you see, the case wasn't worth a million dollars, and if I had taken it, there would have been an implied guarantee of result. And that's Wait what gets lawyers Let me in trouble. understand this. You, t you're, a, you're a mercenary. You're yeah. a hired gun. Yes, but I'm not a fool. Well, why would it, you have been a fool to, to pick up the million and go from there? Because the fee that I was being offered was so outrageous in comparison to the work that had to be done, although it was a first-degree murder case. Right. It wasn't worth a million dollars. The guy's life may have been worth a million dollars to him, but there's two... Wait a minute, a first-degree murder case? Drug-related? Yes. Ah. Yes, he was a professional hitman. Foreigner? Yes. You lose one of those cases after you take a fee like that, and your family's going to be visiting you at the cemetery real fast. Despite the peril to his practice from clients who don't pay and from those who offer to pay too much, Joel Hershorn says the biggest threat of all comes from the government. Look, we are endangered. Criminal defense lawyers are endangered because of the various attacks on us by the government, not only from informants, former clients, Internal Revenue Service, these forms that we have to fill out. And we're in danger because the government thinks it can win the war on drugs by putting good lawyers out of business. Oh, that's preposterous. Somehow we're going to have an impact against the drug law, uh, against drug dealing by going after a few lawyers. No, what we're going after, what we're continuing to go after, are the drug dealers. Steve Trott is an assistant U.S. attorney general in charge of the criminal division of the Department of Justice. Our objective is on the drug dealers and racketeers, and we're going after the profitability of those kinds of businesses, and we're trying to dismantle the financial empires that they're, they're putting together. It's that it, simple. Is a drug dealer, is he entitled to the best attorney that he can find and buy? Not with drug money. Alan Dershowitz is a professor at the Harvard University Law School. I get calls all the time from lawyers who used to represent defendants in RICO cases, racketeering, corrupt organization cases, drug cases, who tell me, hey, I won't go near those cases because now. Because? I don't want to be hauled before a grand jury. I don't want my tax returns audited. I don't want my fees public knowledge. I don't want myself becoming a witness in a case. I don't want myself being declared a mob lawyer in the newspapers. So they're being scared off, and that, in the end, hurts us all. 
Last spring, we went with Joel Hershorn to a meeting of his peers, the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers in Atlanta, Georgia. They consider themselves an endangered species. What we have seen as a well-orchestrated move by the Justice Department to turn the war on crime into a war on the criminal defense bar. What worries these lawyers most is that new law which gives the Department of Justice the power to force attorneys to forfeit their fees, to give them up, if the government can prove that the money paid them by their clients has come from the proceeds of crime. Why shouldn't the government be able to confiscate attorneys' fees if those attorneys' fees came from the proceeds of crime? I work for my salary when I represent somebody accused of a crime. They shouldn't be able to take it away just the same way as if you sold someone who was engaged in crime your house and they found out that that house was purchased with money which was earned as the proceeds of a crime, they should not be able to come back and take the money away from you after you've sold someone your house. That new law prompted a remarkable announcement in Atlanta from Joel Hershorn. Let me tell you how serious I think it is and what I've decided to do about it. I have not taken a new drug case for a new drug client since November. One of his colleagues thought this was good news for him. Jeff Weiner just handed me a note and said, Joel, please feel free to refer the drug cases you are turning down. To <laughs> One of the problems that never gets talked about in law school is money, fees. Uh, where, do, where do you get your money from if you're a criminal lawyer and you're representing uh, guilty defendants? And let's not mince any words. The job of a criminal lawyer in the United States today, for the most part, is to defend people who are guilty of sin. Occasionally you get an innocent defendant, but that's a rarity. Shame. Shame on Professor Dershowitz. Shame on him for saying that. Because Doesn't he understand that we still live in the United... Maybe he's synthesized, too. We still live in the United States of America. Persons who are accused of crime are presumed to be innocent. Oscar Goodman, who has been called a mouthpiece for the mob, practices law here in Las Vegas, the town that organized crime helped put on the map. And it's money from organized crime, in addition to drug money, money used for legal fees that the government is after. And some of that, the government says, has gone to pay Oscar Goodman whose lavish offices have been dubbed by law enforcement people the house the mob built. Here's my favorite room. This is uh, referred to as the Godfather's room by some members of law enforcement. Over a period of two decades, Goodman has defended people like the late Meyer Lansky, the late Nick Civella, and Anthony Spilatro, men the FBI identifies as leaders of the mob. Are you a mob lawyer? What mob? I'm simply asking, are you a mob No, lawyer? I'm a good lawyer. I'm a lawyer who defends citizens who are accused of crime. Period. Period. Now, I can't help it if these uh, monkeys out there want to call me a mob lawyer. That's their problem. Well, you represent. Meyer Lansky used to represent. Nick Savella. All right, are they mobsters? Anthony Spilatro. Who calls them mobsters? I think that the general perception has been that Lansky, Savella, and Spilatro are members of organized crime. Well, all I can tell you, Mr. Wallace, is that in my opinion, they're used as scapegoats because of law enforcement's inability to control the streets and the uh, epidemic of crime in the streets. They have to create monsters, and they create them. These people are human beings. They're citizens. Why do so many mobsters or alleged mobsters come to Oscar Goodman? They feel that they can trust me. They know that I won't give them up. They know that uh, when they come to me, I'm not going to be representing other clients who are cooperating against them. And Goodman condemns the government's use of professional witnesses who have turned against their former colleagues. He says they are paid to perjure themselves. So a man like uh, Jimmy the Weasel Fratiano? Uh, a piece of garbage. Then let him sue me. Really? A piece of garbage. Because? Because he's a liar and because he's living off of our tax dollar. You know, I had a case where he was a witness and I couldn't believe what uh, the United States of America was paying him in order for him to be a professional witness to make other people do his time. Joe Valachi? Uh, another real genius punk. But as in defending drug dealers, the lawyer who defends racketeers also has his nervous moments. There were a couple of clients who had a dispute, and instead of going to the courts over their dispute, they went to me as an arbiter, and uh, we were in my office, and 
one of the clients was sitting over here, and one of the clients was sitting over there, and I closed the door, and I wanted to hear what the problem was. What was the problem? It doesn't really matter what the problem was, but unfortunately, I leaned against the light switch, and the lights went out, and I got to be honest with you, I was a little concerned at that point. I hit the floor. So where do the people Oscar Goodman represents, like Tony Spilatro, where do they get their money? In order for Tony Spilatro to retain Oscar Goodman, he's got to have a lot of money. Where does the money come from? I assume whatever monies I get from, I don't ask him. All I know is when Mr. Spilatro is with me, he's a kind, decent, attentive, genteel person. This man who was alleged to have... This man who is a creation of law enforcement's puts, vivid imagination. Put somebody's head in a vise until the eyes popped out? I represented him on that case, and the judge found that the witness who testified as to the vice and the eyes and all of that nonsense uh, was a liar. Is it conceivable, Mr. Goodman, you're just turning your eyes away from where your clients get their money? You don't want to ask too many questions? Intent, intentional ignorance of where they get their money? No, it's not relevant as to where they get their money as far as I'm concerned. They're irrelevant. To, to me, it's irrelevant as to where they get their money. The grocer doesn't ask where they get their money. The podiatrist, the chiropractor, the doctor, they don't ask. Why should I have to ask? You know who Stephen Trott is? I uh, know Mr. Trott. Respect him? As much as I can, any prosecutor. Any prosecutor you don't? I don't care for prosecutors. Because? Because I feel, well, I have my own little uh, feeling about prosecutors. I think the only reason anybody would want to be in that particular job yeah. is if they're aspiring to a judgeship or if they stay in the job too long that they have some mental deficiency. There's got to be some sickness to want to do that kind of work forever. Mr. Trott, a man comes into my office. I am a defense attorney. He puts $100,000 in cash or check in front of me, says, I want to retain you. Then I, as the attorney, have to say to him, where'd you get this money? Where'd you get this money, correct? You don't have to say anything you want. Well, I'm wait simply a minute. telling I... you that it's very, very easy to stay out of trouble. I want that $100,000. What's more important to you, the $100,000 or being a legal uh, member of the United States of America who's not getting paid with drug money? You're not after lawyers. Oh, no, we're not after lawyers and we never have been. Oh, please. Steve Trotz. Please! What? <laughs> I mean, it, it's almost humorous uh, that they're not after lawyers and never have been. Every case that I'm involved in, I get hit with a grand jury subpoena for one reason or another. Do I represent too many people? Uh, do I, uh, who's paying my fee? Uh, how much is the fee? The FBI is coming to my office wired up in order to entrap me, in order to get me to obstruct justice. And they're disappointed because when they do it, they strike out because I'm not doing anything wrong. You, you know why, Mr. Wallace? Mm. Because when you're representing the type of targeted people like I represent, if you're anything other than like Caesar's wife, if you're not beyond reproach, they'll gobble you up. What they're saying is that you are keeping them from representing the rights of the accused because the accused can't hire the lawyers they want to hire. They have the money, but you're not letting them use that money. Anybody who's charged in the court system in this country is going to be given full representation under the law. The indigent person who doesn't have any money at all going into federal court is going to have a competent lawyer appointed to represent him or her, and that person is going to get a full and complete defense attended to by a judge. Not as competent, obviously, as a Hershorn or a Goodman who are working in the very free private enterprise system that you revere so highly, Mr. Trott. You don't have the right to hire the best lawyer that drug or extortion or ransom or kidnapping money will buy. It's that simple. If the cases keep on going the way they are, Attorneys are going to be called before grand juries, and pretty soon they're going to have to divulge what the client tells to them. It's never going to happen to me, because if I'm ever put in a position where I have to tell something a client told me, I'd rather go to the can, and after I do my time for the contempt, I'll get out of the business, and maybe uh, become some kind of a revolutionary. And what will Joel Hirshhorn do if he stops defending drug dealers? White collar's the thing today. Uh, there's an awful lot of uh, boiler room fraud, uh, telephone fraud, uh, insurance scams, Internal Revenue Service uh, has been cranking up investigations. People who, who, who uh, bilk old ladies out of their life savings. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I can see uh, representing someone who uh, bilks a little old lady out of, uh, out of her money, sure. I can't help it. I mean, uh, if a man's going to pay me to do it, I'm going to do it. That's my gun, that license, you know, called practicing law. And if this is the Wild West, I'm a hired gun. You got it? I'm there. Just pay me.
defense lawyers and prosecutors and judges across America cannot seem to agree on whether defense attorneys' fees should indeed be subject to confiscation. But they do agree that the issue will probably have to be decided by the U.S. Supreme Court.